everything we do as human beings, it's games and stories. Games is our behavior. It's designed to get energy. Either we're going to motivate it in positive ways or manipulate it in negative ways. However toxic a person is, there's a wound there that's unresolved. They're playing a negative game. There is a story that is driving that pattern. It is not your job to fix their story, it is theirs. You cannot help them by jumping in the hole and drowning yourself with them. You score no karma points, you score no advantages. The world is not served by you diminishing yourself. A lighted candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. We don't fight darkness by fighting darkness. We banish darkness by being so full of light, it just disappears all by itself. We don't need to fight it. We just need to be aware and be present and be playful. You do that, your life will change. The lives of the people around you will change simply because you become a source of light. In today's busy world, how can we find the inspiration, knowledge, and energy to live a healthy and empowered life? If we balance and harmonize our mind, exercise our body, live according to the laws of nature and connect to spirit can we find a way to heal become our authentic self and live our purpose with love i am your hostess amy fournier and welcome back to awakening aphrodite you know i'm sure that you understand how music is powerful right have you ever been like in a bad mood or sad or whatever and you just put on some happy music or maybe you're just driving along and a really cool song comes up. It can bring up memories to a time in your life or just kind of like pick up your energy and take it to the next level. Just go ahead and start singing along with it and having a good time. I know I use music a lot, particularly to bring up my energy and to bring down my energy. Music is powerful. It's an ingredient that we need in a healthy, happy, holistic life. So I have a couple favorite go-tos that I use to help me use music to change my state, to get me again, to either bring my energy up or to bring my energy down or whatever I want to do just to change my body, mind, and emotions. My number one favorite thing is the core harmonizer. You might've heard me talk about this before. I have a great episode with the founder. What is the core harmonizer? Well, it's basically like Think of it as like a piece of furniture, almost like an end table. It's beautiful. It's, it's handmade custom wood, and it's all purposefully, consciously created. The shape of it, it's got crystals in it, it's got light therapy, and it produces harmonized sound music into your environment. You play it basically just like a speaker, and a lot of the music on there is and the frequency of the heart chakra, and it's extremely balancing and grounding and soothing. I have mine going almost all the time. My dogs love it, I love it, my friends love it, my family loves it, everyone loves when they come over. I even play it during when I get a home massage or some other little self-care thing I do. I play it in the morning too, when I'm having my morning tea and doing my intentions to begin my day. It's just a powerful tool, and you can find out more about that on my website if you want to check it out. It's worth every penny. I use it literally every day. My other favorite sound healing tool is the work of Ian Morris, another buddy of mine who I did two episodes with, and his work with Listening to Smile. That's the name of his company. Why? Because when he played his music, people would start to smile. So when he first started, he named the company Listening to Smile because people would just naturally smile. They just felt better. I love this stuff. You can download albums, put them directly on your phone or computer or whatever. I often, when I need to just calm down or just get myself grounded and centered after a busy day, I'll walk my dogs and put on one of his Listening to Smile albums and listen to them, listen to the album while I'm out in nature or even just driving or whatever. It's better with headphones because it goes into the left and the brain hemisphere uh, more directly, but just play it. It doesn't really matter, right? It's just kind of like anything else in life. It's just, just do it. If you can't do it perfectly, it doesn't mean don't do it all. Just something is always better than nothing. If you can't work out for half an hour, work out for five minutes. It's better than nothing. Well, the same goes for music. Just do the best you can. And I play that all the time. 
Sometimes I even play the listening to smile when I leave the house and I'm going to be gone for a while and I just want my dogs to stay chill and calm and not have it just totally quiet for them, you know? It's just very soothing and relaxing. It's a great company. I love it so much. And you can check out that on my website, eStore as well. There's a coupon code there for you to save some money. And you can even join their annual membership, which I did, because they send you, this is really cool, listen to this. They send you automatically one album every month that has that is correlated with the astrological chart, like what's going on with the planets and everything. So it's totally dialed in to the present time. And then obviously the idea is to listen to that album during that month's lifetime. And that helps harmonize and align you with the cosmos. Isn't that brilliant? I'm telling you, these people, they're killing it. I love it. So check out with Listening to Smile and the Core Harmonizer on my e-store. Use my coupon codes. And while you're there, take a look around with all my other favorite stuff. And uh, now let's get to the show. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the show. Today, my guest is Jeremy Roadruck. This is a really fun conversation. Let me tell you, Jeremy is a ticket. Okay, this guy is, he's 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 incredible. What a character. He's got a great bubbly energy, a super sense of humor. I just love this guy. I enjoyed this conversation so much. And to be honest, I really didn't know what to expect because he was referred to me as a really great guest to have on my show by my new friend, Josh T- Tyler, who has a great episode, by the way. Hopefully you heard that. And it is a little bit pertinent to, th- to today's discussion with Jeremy That episode with Josh Tyler was one of my favorites. We get into what it means to to be a savage gentleman and how to attract or even raise one. Super cool guy. Love it, love it, love it. And anyway, Josh referred me to Jeremy and yep, hit it out of the park. So thanks again, Josh, for that great referral. Jeremy is the creator of the Roadmap to Relationship Mastery for Men. He's a husband, a father, an international kung fu champion and a six-degree master multi-best-time selling author, hypnotherapist, neurostrategist, and consultant. How about that, okay? In his spare time, I guess he sleeps. I don't know. He's also the author of the only parenting book with a money-back guarantee. Jeremy's on a mission to help dads who lead a business to create strong marriages, raise amazing kids and grandkids, and have businesses they love. What a beautiful mission, isn't that? He's been through bankruptcy, living in a tent in the woods, car repossession, kicked out of where he was living after his second lung collapsed, closed his dream business, and more. But through it all, he developed specific strategies and tools to help keep his mindset playful and strong. I'll tell you, you know, I'll just add, it's always these people who have not had an easy life because they went through the hard knocks, because they had to face the fire and went into the dark night of the soul and all these really painful, difficult things happen to them that they rise to the occasion. They they become stronger because of it. You know, I heard a great expression just the other day from one of my mentors, Dr. Christiane Northrup, and she said something to the effect of, don't pray for a lighter load, pray for a stronger back. Isn't that great? I love that quote. So Jeremy, I love having people like this because they show us in spite of the heartaches and the pain and the struggles and the challenges, you can be the phoenix and rise above it. Yes, you can, and others have. And people that you've seen on the other side of it are not there because nothing bad has happened to them. They might be there because of it, okay? So hopefully that gives you hope. I'm happy to say that Jeremy is happily married and helping men love their lives and their wives. Super fun episode. We talk about the core of masculinity. Jeremy shares with us his three Ps. He also talks about the three tips to please the queen. You got to please the queen, everybody, whether even if that queen is you, you got to please yourself. Hallelujah. 
So enjoy this really fun conversation. Please do check out the show notes so you can find out more on Jeremy. He's an amazing guy. He's got a lot of information to share with you in a lot of different areas, and he's super fun too and cool. So enjoy this episode with Jeremy. And we're back, everybody. Jeremy Roadruck, welcome to Awakening Aphrodite. Amy, thank you for the opportunity, and I'm excited for today's conversation. Me too. You know, I've heard you say that appreciation is an antidote to things in life. And why don't we kick it off with a little real-time talk, Jeremy, about, you know, life is busy. We all got a million things going on. There's this big push to try to be present in our lives. And what do you have to say about appreciation? And what, what can we learn from you in that regard to be happier? Well, the big thing I see that makes most people miserable, like in my world, suffering is self-generated, right? Nobody can make you suffer but you. Pain, yes, people can cause you pain. Situations can cause you pain. But your story and, and what you tell and how you connect and how you put yourself in very often creates suffering versus learning how to intelligently detach. So kind of the, the pattern I've seen of how that happens, especially in, in couples, uh, which is where I love to work, but... Entitlement, well, it's expectation, which leads to obligation, which leads to entitlement. And, and once you've got that pattern running, people will get very entrenched in kind of where they're at. And when I work with my clients, the, the antidote to that is ownership, right? Because, okay, this is my stuff. What I said had an impact on you. I'll own that. Response ability, which is the ability to choose a response. And then the third is appreciation because whatever struggle, whatever challenge we're facing, very often at an earlier stage of our life, we dreamed to be in that situation. And now we're here and it's like you go on a journey and you see that far distant horizon, but when you get to that horizon, there's another horizon that you didn't anticipate, you couldn't see. And so if we can appreciate the experience that got us where we are and we can appreciate the moment that we're in, and I'm not saying be you know ridiculously Pollyanna and, and po toxic positivity about appreciating it, but just going, man, what an opportunity to raise my standards. What an opportunity to, to calibrate and adjust with this other person or this other situation. And if we can stay in that place, that ownership and that responsibility gets easier because the appreciation opens us up and, and instead of being all tense and closed off. And then we feel like we're in this fight all the time. Yes. I, you know, and I, I think of it a lot myself with just, kind of like we take so much for granted and just appreciating just the things, you know, the old saying that you don't know what you got till it's gone type thing. You know, it's like your body, you know, you don't ever think about your stomach until all of a sudden it hurts you one night and you're doubled over in pain and you can't breathe and you, you, have, you can't think of anything else. But how many times, days, months, years, do you not even think about your stomach maybe for like 10 years until it hurts? And it's the same thing, like, just in life, right? I mean, you want to appreciate clean air or, you know, look at the forest fires in, in California and they couldn't breathe for a while. The air was toxic. And, you know, pick your poison, right? So appreciating is such, I think, a beautiful way for us to start our discussion because we take a lot for granted that is of things that are required to even have a foundation of a healthy life, not to mention all the bells and whistles, you know? Yeah, well, I've I've been fortunate to collapse a lung twice and be hospitalized eleven time, eleven days the first time, six the second time. So every night that I go to bed and I don't have a bunch of ho uh, hospital machines going ping, I don't have medical staff hitting me with morphine and, and Vicodin every couple of hours. I don't have a tube in my side to reinflate my lung. I'm like, you know, last night I didn't sleep that great. I was up every hour. I had some stuff on my mind, but still, my wife is in my bed next to me. And when I collapsed my lungs, I was single. Uh, well, I was dating somebody. I wasn't married. But, yeah. but it's, like, it's like my wife is next to me. My, kid, you know, my kids are in the house. My cats. Like it's, it's a whole different vibe. So even though, yeah, tonight wasn't that great. But, man, it could have been so much worse than it wasn't. So I can appreciate the experience of it and go, okay, what can I do to have a better night's sleep tonight? You know, I think that's such a brilliant way to even look at things that we can all take to heart as a friendly reminder that, you know, I think a good practice for mental health and hygiene is to 
no matter how bad a situation is, like you're dealing with something that really sucks, but try to find like one or two good things in that moment to pull yourself out of going down the toilet of spiral of crap. You know what I mean? Like, okay, but like you're to your point. Okay, but you know what? I have a beautiful wife I love next to me and my kids are safe in bed in the next room. Right now I can't breathe very well, but you know, you're at least finding a couple things to, you know, kind of keep you from spiraling down into the depths of despair. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's 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 a framework uh, that I teach is we start with whenever something happens, like any negative moment in your life, if you just ask yourself, you know, what can I learn from this? Or what, what's good about this? And, and nothing. Okay, nothing, but what could be good about this? And, and, and because you ask yourself that question, you begin to neutralize the negativity because, well, well, maybe it means I should raise my standards. Oh, that's interesting. Well, maybe it means I should be careful who I partner with or who I allow into my life in such a place. Oh, that's interesting. Like, just what's good about this begins to change because your instincts are going to be nothing. It's the worst ever. It's right. horrible. Right. Okay, great. Write that down. What else? What else could it mean? What could be good about this? And just that what could opens you to potentialities, right? I had a client who was, who was in a place and I was like, so, so what's going well in your life? Nothing. <laughs> okay, what are you proud of? Nothing. Grateful for? Nothing. Happy about? Nothing. Excited for? Nothing. Okay, what could you be happy about? Literally, no hesitation, my sons. Wow. Because when I asked him, what could you be? It opened him to a potentiality. When I said, what are you? That's present state. And he was not in a good place. So when I said, well, what are you grateful for? Nothing. What could you be grateful for? <laughs> opened his mind, opened his heart. And we found something that he could, oh, I could be proud of my sons. I love them. I'm so happy to have them. Oh, dude, there's that gratitude. And in one question, because our brain's wired to answer Whatever question we ask, it answers. So like, do you still have a polka dot tree in your backyard? Your, your brain answers the question, even if it's a crap question, because that's what it's wired to do. Cool, let's leverage that. Mm -hmm. I think that's brilliant. You know, it's funny, it reminds me, I also had a client that just broke up uh, with a very serious boyfriend. The same, you know, like you're in the depths of hell and you don't see anything good about it. But as we dug a little deeper, it was like, well, you know, this will give me a little more time and I can clean out some of my closets. I mean, it was stupid, right? But it was really searching for something that it would open up and allow so at least she could grasp on something good about it, finding some kind of something good about it. Well, it's going to allow me to catch up with some old friends. It's going to allow me to get more sleep. Uh, you know, whatever. I mean, it, yeah, we were at one point we were grasping for straws, but to your point is that we were trying to just, you know what I think it's very valuable about that, Jeremy, is it, it helps you from being like myoptically focused on what you don't want, the problem, which is what we do. We tend to get like laser in on what I don't want, and then you're creating more of what you don't want, right? So yeah, so at least it kind of like, I just like that analogy of you're crawling your way out of from spiraling down, 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 which we tend to do. Our, our energy follows where the energy has started to go. So it's, exactly. Yeah, so. yeah, well, part of my life is as a hypnotherapist. And so what I tell people all the time is all stories are true and some of them actually happened. Yeah, that's great. When we have a moment of impact, right, then, oh, this is a problem. Okay, that's a, hypno that's a hypnosis, right? That's a, we just put ourselves into a trance of resourcefulness. This is a challenge. This is an opportunity. This is a crisis. This is a calling. Those are all different one-word stories that marshal different resources. So if we say this is a challenge or a crisis or it's traumatic or it's, it's, it's a tragedy, then, then we're telling ourselves a frame of reference that we will then maintain identity with. Mm -hmm. If we say this is an opportunity, we've just shifted an opportunity for what? what? An opportunity for growth, for expansion, for understanding, for compassion. Like that becomes a springboard into all sorts of other stories that we could create. And then the story drives our behavior, what I call games. And it's just, it moves us where in better places. And sometimes, like you said, we get that myopic focus because we come up with this one really strong interpretation and we're in a negative frame of reference. So a negative story is easy. And then it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It just kind of sucks us in. And say, like, wait a minute, if this was a really bad movie, like so bad that you would like get up and walk out and not even ask for your money back, and then it was on TV for free, would you waste time watching it? 
No. Okay, so then why are you telling yourself the same crap story that you hate about this relationship that you hate and this person you never want to be around ever again and you're still, that just tells me there's something unresolved. Mm -hmm. There's a story there that needs to be shifted and once we do, it can open up new possibilities. And I like that you, you're into the story idea because, you know, we, our words are so powerful. I've done many shows on that with like Laurel Arnica. We can, uh, we can put that in the show notes. And I don't know if you're familiar with, um, oh, he's keeping me, Mark. Uh, he's the word guy. Uh, we did a great show with him. It's escaping me at the moment. But, you know, the labels we put on things and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's very, very powerful. So the, the how we call something something is we can kind of call it into being, you know, the whole abracadabra thing. You know, once you once you speak the word, it's like the, that's the next step to manifesting it. So don't ever, that's why you don't speak badly about yourself or any of that stuff because you're calling it into manifestation when it becomes a, a spoken word. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's the process because once you've had a thought that's just living inside of you and you can enjoy whatever it is. But the instant you give word to it or write it down, that's you're putting it out into the universe. You're putting it out into a concrete structure in some way, shape or form. And then it starts to become a, hyp a hypnosis because we begin to believe that story. So it's like, well, is the story worth telling? Is it going to take me where I want to go? Well, well, that's a crap story. Awesome. So replace it. Mm hmm and you've done a you've done a lot of work with your own story. Can you give us a? I mentioned it in the intro, but uh, give us a little background because I know you're like a relationship master, and that's really your thing. You 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 really help men and women, and you get a lot of real great stuff on helping parenting successfully and consciously. Um, tell us just a brief what brought you into this because you know you really went through the school of hard knocks and. You had a particularly uh, traumatic thing that happened to you. I believe you're only about five years old, right? So, yeah, can you give us just a little background on who, what brought you into where you are now, Jeremy? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I had a moment of impact when I was five years old. We were a military family living in Saudi Arabia, and I went out past uh, the security gate, and there was a security guard there, and something inappropriate happened. And it took me sideways because, you know, little kids are raised, you know, don't do bad things, you're going to get punished. And so I went out beyond where I was supposed to, I broke the rules, and then something bad happened. And then rather than something bad happened, or he was wrong for what happened, I made myself wrong because I was out playing where I wasn't supposed to. And so it shifted my identity and I wasn't, it wasn't a conscious choice. It was just, I'm wrong, I did something bad, and so I have to hide. And it, it drove my psychology into what I called survival mode for a very, very long time. And then when we came back to the US a year later, something else happened with some kids up the street, also inappropriate. But I couldn't tell anybody, because if I tell anybody, I'm gonna get in trouble. So five, six years old, I'm running this pattern of existential, like, I, I'm wrong. Not what happened was wrong, I'm wrong. Cause guilt, yeah, guilt, yeah, and shame. Yep. And so, and so it's like, I have to hide. And very quickly, I realized what people say is one thing, what they mean is a second thing, and what they do is a third thing, and they may not have anything to do with each other. And so I'm left with, I can't trust adults, I can't trust kids, and I can't believe anything anybody tells me. Wow. Fantastic. It's a great place to grow up. Never. <laughs> like, never. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I kind of had to socialize myself, and I had to kind of put Humpty Dumpty back together because I don't understand why things don't go together. Why is there not consistency? I could see these, these cracks in logic and inconsistencies, but I also knew I was worthless. So anybody who tried to be nice to me, I would spin and make them reject me on my terms as quick as possible so that I could stay in control of situations. Mm. You, re you, re you rejected before they reject you. Yeah. Absolutely, because I knew they were going to, because I'm already rejecting myself, so you can't yeah. like me because I don't like me. Yeah. Yeah, I know all about that, yeah. So I'm seven years old and some part of me believes if I lose this game of tic-tac-toe, I'm going to die. So my level of intensity with everything, I'm either life and death all in or nothing and there's no in between. And so I realized like other kids are pulling away from me. I had enough awareness to see the, the social impact. So I became a good mimic and a good uh, chameleon and I just hid 
and I would only play your reindeer games if I decided it was worth my time. Otherwise, I could just disappear in a room, like easily, or I could lead the room. And so it was a really weird place to kind of grow up as a kid, mm. and a lot of anger. Sounds very lonely. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in my head. Eventually, I learned to make really good company. So I'm, I like don't have, I don't have a high need for social drive. Like I'm perfectly fine by myself for days at a time. But I also, I'm actually a, an extrovert and I love to be around people, but I don't need to be around people. I'm like, I'm not miserable by myself. So it's a really interesting place to be because I have now a lot of flexibility in my behavior that I can like, like Bruce Lee and be like water. I can become lots of different things, which makes me a great, like, I'm not quite a coach and I'm not quite a, a mentor. I'm not quite a strategist. I kind of do all of the above. Because it's like, well, what is needed in this moment? Maybe I do need to crack your ego a little bit and poke at you and make you fight back. Or maybe I need to model for you something you've never thought before. Or maybe I need to ask questions because the answer is inside you and you just haven't found it yet. And so it's, it's kind of blending across skill sets because the goal, I don't care who's right. I care what's right. And let's get to the result. What's going to do the greatest good for the largest number of people, yourself included. Let's just do that like quickly. And so all of that came out of kind of this growing up because I had a lot of being made wrong and a lot of judgmentalism and a lot of just all the stuff. And my parents never knew about what happened until I was in my mid thirties. Like I kept it, I kept it held back for a really long time, mm -hmm. but that's kind of what drove me into the tools, the experiences. I ended up becoming a Kung Fu master, master practitioner in hypnotherapy and neurolinguistic programming, international champion. Like I did all these really high level things because I just, I had to go explore and I couldn't trust anybody else. That was a really long time coming, almost 30 something years before I could really trust people, which is kind of sad on one level. Well, at least you learned it eventually. Some people die and they never learn it. Trust is, that's a big one. That's yeah. Big one. yeah, yeah. Especially when, you know, I, I, obviously we don't, we're not gonna go into what happened when you were five, but if any kind of physical or emotional violation of any kind. I mean, trust is, forget it. And then you, you know, we, our bodies are biosymbolic, you know, and you're going to exude, your body is going to exude that trauma biosymbolically, especially we know that shame and guilt can manifest as inflammation and, and chronic diseases in the body, like fibromyalgia, arthritis. These are all very, very common. The work of uh, Dr. Mario Martinez is really pioneering all that stuff, even like Dr. Christian Northrup. I mean, I'm sure you're very familiar with it, but this is, you know, just for the audience is that, you know, we, we can't escape these painful experiences, no matter how old we are when they happen to us, because if you don't move that energy and process it and fully experience it, transcend and include it, as Ken Wilber says, transcend and include it, you're going to just stuff it and then it's going to biosymbolically express itself in a way that you probably don't like. And you're going to go to every doctor in the world and wonder why no one can fix you and they can't figure out what quote unquote is wrong with you because all their tests are showing you're fine, but you're not fine. You know what I mean? It's, but, but that's what the body does because you know, we're all here to spiritually learn these lessons. And, uh, and until we learn the lesson, we just keep getting the, getting the hammer put down. It's like, you're not getting the lesson. You know, it's like the person who keeps having that same bad relationship time and time again, different person, but same situation, you know, and that, that was me too for a while, you know, so all this stuff I've done myself. Um, yeah, but guilt, Jeremy, wow, I don't know. I'm right with you on the childhood trauma. Um, and then I grew up Catholic, Catholic on top of that. So yeah, well, my dad's deacon, my dad's deacon in the Catholic church. And it's funny cause he, he and I, not, he and I see a lot eye to eye on stuff, but I came from a Buddhist Taoist perspective oh, and, and Kung Fu stuff yeah. where he, he went through Catholicism and, and specifically if you want to dig into Catholicism, there's a guy named Tad Guzzi. And he okay. writes about Catholicism as a sacramental system of expressing of expressing human spirituality. And so this, the sacraments become these kind of milestones or, or way stations that we visit as we elevate as a person in our spiritual growth. Um, and they're little short books that he's written, but they're really, really interesting. Okay. Um, 
but it's, it's funny because my dad and I see a lot of stuff the same, just from totally different cultural frames. Mm -hmm. But we both kind of go, yeah, that makes sense. I could dig it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting, having a dad as a deacon. Ooh. Yeah, so, no, okay. it's, it's, my parents gave me unconditional love because they didn't, I mean, they just did the best they knew how to live, live their faith. Um, my mom said, you may be the only Bible some people will ever read. So is it a good book or a great book? Yeah. And I was like, that, like, like years later, I realized, I go, that's a really good frame of reference yeah. because there's not a lot of judgment in it. It's just a reflexive question to like call out the best inside you of like, how are you showing up? Mm -hmm. If you profess this faith or not that faith, because I didn't get confirmed in, in Catholicism because I had some, some reservations about some inconsistencies and my dad was the deacon and you would think, you know, social contract and, and people would put pressure on him and, you know, what's your son doing? And my parents both said, well, at least he has enough strength of character to follow his own thinking. Yeah, right on. Right? And so they didn't force me to kowtow or, or you know, I'm going to profess this faith, but I don't actually believe it just to, like, get the kudos from them. It's like, nah, I don't care. I don't need your approval. Well, that shows a lot of emotional maturity for your parents not to have you, their child, be an extension of them in the eyes of other people, you know, which is where the control of your kid comes in, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, that, yeah, that never would have worked with me. <laughs> yeah, good, good like, for them. When I was, when I was, when I was four, before the, before the stuff that went sideways, like, I was raised on the leash because I'd run into traffic because I'm, like, curious about everything. I'd fall asleep standing up because I, like, just, I'm excited, like, what's going on? What's happening? Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. So I, was, I was my own person from like the yeah. rip. And yeah. yeah you, you came out that way, huh? That's awesome. Pretty much. Yeah. Are you an only child? No, I have, a, a, I'm actually, technically I am number seven of 10, but only, wow. two, of, but only two of us made it to birth. Oh, um, wow. Oh, yeah. My, my mom got pregnant four, uh, three times. My brother was number four mm -hmm. and then two more than me, then three more. And then she got her tube side. Um, because just her body just couldn't handle, um, handle the experience. So that led to some guilt too, because when I found that out at like eight or nine years old, it's like, why am I alive? And I hate my life and I hate me and I hate all this stuff. Why am I here? And I've got eight siblings who aren't, how effed up is that? So that, that was fun. Like, like more guilt. That. That's yeah, like yeah. even more guilt. <laughs> but, it, but that was all my story. Like I yeah. chose, I have to uh -huh. live for six of them. My brother can live for, 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 for two of them. Like, I chose that story. Like, nobody made me. Yeah. And why? Who's that helping, Jeremy? Shut up. <laughs> you know? like. Yeah. That's really mature of you, Jeremy. Jeremy, with your clients, what are some of the common stories that you hear nowadays? And, like, how do you help people overcome them? So I'm sure, you know, just to relate to the audience, some of the, some of the things, let's just say, Jeremy, that we don't think that are stories. We're like, oh, no, but this is true, Jeremy and Amy. Like, this is my life. Okay, like... But in your, in your opinion, what would you say? Well, actually, that's a story, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's all stories, right? And, and the reason I say that, I'll preface that with this. The unconscious mind runs 2 million to 11 million bits of data a second. The conscious mind only goes 20 to 137. So we are distorting, deleting, and generalizing literally every single second of our life. So whatever we're experiencing isn't actually what we're experiencing it. Once we can, like create the consciousness of it it's an internal representation of what just happened because it's already been filtered mm -hmm. then we give language to it which is a second level of filtering so what we're actually verbalizing is already distorted based on what we already filtered from our unconscious because our internal our, our our processing systems are so much faster than our conscious mind can keep up so so i'll use men as the specific example because i do so much with men but there's basically there's a boy there's a man and there's a king inside every male there's, there's, or a masculine person, right? There's three layers to that. And when people are caught up in fault and blame and guilt and shame, when they are rationalizing, justifying negative stuff to other people or even themselves, then I know they have an existential wound that's unresolved. And it's generally from their childhood because their inner child doesn't feel safe. And so that's why they justify... I have a right to be this way and I have a right to, and they're really defensive and weaponizing their limitations. Like I can't be that way because something happened, because life is unfair, because of some label, some story, some justification, some rationalization. And, and those things may well and be true. I don't know because it's their life. It's their experience. I'm not here to judge that. I don't, I'm not qualified. 
But when I hear fault and blame and guilt and shame, when I see games that people are playing that they can't win, right? You either play, you either get a loving response or a cry for help. It's either a positive, warm, big, happy type of energy or it's a small, sad, cold. And if somebody is hitting you with small, sad, cold energy, they're not in a good place. Okay, cool, you're stuck in a hole. Maybe I can help, maybe I can't, I don't know. But I'm not gonna add fuel to that fire. I'm not gonna make you wrong for that. I'm gonna do my best to have healthy boundaries and detach because you're not asking for help. I'm a big fan of consent. But but that that baseline, that fault, blame, guilt, shame, until that gets resolved, everything built on top of it is built on an unstable foundation. Mm-hmm. Like my kid messes up. Hey, this is not okay. This is what I needed you to do. This is what you did. Here's the gap. What can we do to fix this? And I say we on purpose because there's a team at an atmosphere. Mm-hmm. So what can we do to make this better? How can we improve this? I don't know. Okay, would you like some ideas? I get consent before I coach. Yeah. Right? Because I'm 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 the two big things I want to give my kids is the ability to create their own emotional safety. So let me model that for them and create that for them so they know what it feels like. And then how to both assert and respect boundaries. That means I got to let them push back. Mm -hmm. That means I have to not always agree with what they're pushing back on, but that's the boundary that they're asserting with me. Hey, long term, I'm not okay with that. But right this moment, I hear you. I'll take a step back. We're cool. Mm -hmm. Because I'd much rather get results with my kids than be right and hammer them into some, some, some sort of compliance to some sort of program that I have in my head that might not be who they are, what they need. How old are they? Uh, my stepson's 14 and my daughter's nine. Mm-hmm. But if you tell my stepson when he was nine, I'm disappointed in you, he's crushed. Yeah. And my daughter, you say, I'm disappointed in you. Sucks to be you. She doesn't care. <laughs> it just doesn't, it doesn't, it's, that's your problem, not mine. She's more visual kinesthetic. He's more auditory kinesthetic. Right? And so just, just knowing those personality differences, if you tell him anything, man, he will hold you to it because, well, you said we're going to do this thing. It's like, I know you were listening. Damn it. Yeah. Wow. But my daughter doesn't, she doesn't hold. Like, you have to draw it out for her. You have to give her the picture. And then she gets it. But if you just tell her, it, it falls out. And it's not attention deficit. It's this is her pattern of learning different than his. Mm-hmm. Right? And I would think beyond even a pattern of learning, to me, just from what I've heard, it sounds just a sensitivity. He, your son sounds very sensitive. Yeah, he's, he's wired. Just He's auditory. When you ask him questions, um, watch where his eyes go. He pings sideways, and he's like, he's auditory processing. What have you told me? What have I heard? Wow. And my daughter is visual. She looks up. She's like looking and seeing the pictures. Wow. Cool. Excuse me. Excuse me. Eyes over here. I'm over. I'm over here. Yeah. Okay. Look at me, please. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Now, wow. here's, what I need to, here's what I need to see, right? And then it'll be easier for her to follow my pattern of communication. But for him, dude, does that sound right to you or does that sound a little off? Okay. So you're talking their language. Yeah. 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 Because I, par- I can parse, Yeah. right? I, I put together a program for teachers on using hypnotherapy and how we build our model of the world. And I had an intervention specialist in tears during one of my presentations because she'd been doing the job eight years. Nobody had ever told her what to look for and what to listen for explicitly in the communication of her students. And so she's realizing, oh, this kid is kinesthetic, inwardly expressive or low affect. This kid's kinesthetic, outward expressive or external. Um, This kid's auditory, this kid's visual, this kid's conceptual. And it's like, it, it, it rocked her because she's like, how do you know this? I'm like, well, hypnotherapy plus decades and decades of working with kids, three to 94. Mm-hmm. And, and growing up that I, nobody understood me and I wouldn't let them anyway. So I had to understand them. Right. So that's where that abuse drove me in a direction. If I didn't have it, I wouldn't be who I am now. And I wouldn't be able to do what I can do now. So l- let's just pause on that, that. That was a really interesting thing you just said. No one could understand or would understand you, so you had to understand them. So what I'm hearing you say is um, it's like the best defense is a good offense. It was more about you developing your own ability to perceive other people accurately and read them and and to be able to make a decision 
you know, are they safe? What, how are they feeling? Like, basically, you develop that ability. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very young. I had to fit, I had to read people because I had to know how to control them mm. for my safety. Yeah. How much? How much do I tell? How much do I not? Yeah. Right. Because like 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 some adults, you give them enough information that they feel bad and they they take pity on you and let you get away with stuff. Yeah. And, and other adults, no matter what you say, they're just going to ride you and they're going to be hard edge. So you don't give them anything to smack you around with you know, metaphorically. So it's like I learned I learned how to how can I be the most safe because I can't trust anybody. So I have to take control of them, which six, seven, eight, nine years old is a horrible place to be. And it made it hard for like me to be in groups because it was like too much. There was too many people to process so I would shut down or I would go manic and it's like, I'm just not going to be here. Like, this is stupid. Why am I even putting myself in this situation? Mm -hmm. Right. But it wasn't that I felt bad about getting overloaded. I just recognized the pattern. Oh, I'm frying my nervous system. Peace out. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. I, I've seen in your work, you talk about the three P's being present, being powerful and being playful in relationships. Let's let's uh, give us a little rundown. I thought that was great. The three P's, Jeremy. Yeah, so that is the core of masculinity, right? Okay. And 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 a lot of guys, a lot of the quote unquote manosphere talks about power, but dude, if you're not present first, you're not safe. And if you're not playful, you're not creative. Again, you're not safe. And so you know, I did a I did a, a fifteen second clip somewhere, and I'm like, if you need your woman to submit to you, you're pathetic, okay. like. Like if you need that, right? It's like, oh, my woman has to whatever, whatever. It's like, really, she has to play your reindeer games on your terms for you to feel whatever, then that's weakness. That's not strength. My wife is a force of nature and she is free to be exactly who she is. I wouldn't have her any other way. Mm -hmm. And and that doesn't mean we don't crash heads sometimes because we do. And I'm okay with that. Like, babe, you're a force of nature. It's cool. Thank you for sharing your opinion and your perspective. The only two rules, honesty and stay out of the friend zone. And if either of us feel like we're being pushed into the friend zone, it's time to get honest. What's going on, babe? I miss you. What, what's That's happening? That's interesting. Here? The friend out of the friend zone. I never it's, heard it's, it's a quick stopgap because we yeah. both really enjoy each other and and on all levels. And so whenever we feel like we're being cut off or being something's being withheld, like we have a promise to each other not to withheld, withhold love even if we're upset. But we'll, we'll call it like I want to. I want to hold back from you. I don't want to talk to you. Okay, well, is there anything I can do to help make it easier for you to talk to me? Like, we can negotiate oh, it, but, that, wow. but that's, that's the playfulness. Yeah. Even in the middle of a fight, we can find a way wow. to be playful. Because, like, you're the most amazing woman I've ever met. I looked for you for, I, like, I decided at nine I wanted to be a dad, and I didn't marry you and become a dad until I was 39. So, until I healed my own stuff, I kept dating takers. Yeah. Like, she's only the second giver I ever was involved with. And, like, after the... The first time I dated a giver, I was like, holy crap, because like... So different. <laughs> I have to learn to receive. Like, I deserve yeah. to receive. Like, like she... Because yeah. I was smothering, because I would like give and give and give and give, and I would get in a competition, like, I'm going to overgive. And that's... that's I wasn't being present. Because it has to be a flow of give and receive. And so this idea of playful, present, powerful, but where do we start? We start with being present. Mm -hmm. Good, bad, sideways, light, dark, happy, anything... Like, like when I work with men, I talk about the road that most men get into trouble. We go off the road because we start with rejection. We get made wrong. We make our thoughts wrong, our feelings wrong, our wants wrong, our desires wrong. We make something wrong, which then pushes us into our heads. Now we go into patterns of anxiety or anxiousness. And then we go into overwhelm. And then we go into disrespectful behavior, which is taking it out on us or taking it out on other people. We do dumb stuff. And the antidote to all of that is acceptance. Acceptance doesn't mean agreement. But just, this is the reality. Like, like I'm a fighter. I teach people to fall safely. You're falling. Accept the reality you're falling. Because if you resist, you're going to break yourself. If you're in a fight and you refuse to acknowledge the reality of the fight, you're going to die. Because you're not going to show up with your full capacity. You don't have to agree with the experience. But at least acknowledge that you're there. Because then you can enter into the conversation and take control. Or guide. Or disentangle. Or whatever the case. So, so this idea of being present... Take a deep breath. First thing with all my clients, always. Dude, I hear you. Take a deep breath with me. Let's just <sighs> soften the shoulders, relax the pit of your stomach. Just breathe for a second. Okay, you've got two minutes. Just breathe. 
And as we do that, literally, you can see them come back into themselves. They get more solid and say, okay, now what's going on? Not why do you feel this way? I, I'm not a big fan of why. What do you want? What's happening? How do you know? Like what's in house is where we find our power. But that's presence. Then we go to playfulness because that's where we begin to find creativity and loosen it. Like, dude, life is a death sentence. We're all worm food waiting to happen. So get over that. And that's the reaction I want right there is that, that laughter. And it's like, oh, yeah, you're right. We are worm food waiting to happen. Why am I being such a putz about this? Cool. Now we can begin to apply power in the right places. Because for masculine, masculine's not lazy. We're efficient because we have a cycle of energy that we have to rebuild our energy. We fatigue. So masculine gets bored, feminine doesn't. Because masculine, this is unworthy of my time. It's unworthy of my energy, so I disengage and conserve it, now I'm bored. Feminine, there's always things to do. There's always more to grow and expand and adjust and adapt. And men can be in their feminine and be all involved in everything. And women can be in their masculine and be disengaged and bored, right? It's, it might be right brain, left brain. There's you know still big conversations to have about that. But it's that idea of be present first, then bring the playfulness in, because then your power is safe. It can be utilized versus I'm right, shut up, do it my way. Why are you so stupid? You're wasting time. Like that, that to me is somebody who's so attached into power and, and they may be present, but there's no playfulness. That's like, dude, you need to take it back. You know, why, why do so many guys make light of so many serious situations? It's that creative, playful side of us to like, look, I don't want to go life and death on this. Do I, do I need, like my wife will be upset about something. Do I need to get a hammer? Am I hitting someone? Mm. Uh, no, it's not that. Okay. Just checking. So tell me more. Yeah. Cause it changes my frame. Cause I will go and hurt someone if I need to, because like, okay, who, who am I pushing off? The, who am I pushing downstairs? Like, I'm, let's go. I have no problem with that. And she's like, no, no, that's not what we need. Oh, okay. Just checking. <laughs> well, it kind of puts it in perspective. Let's add a fourth P. Perspective. <laughs> Perspective. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So through the three P's for the core of masculinity, do you have corresponding three letters for femininity of that of, at all? Just wondering. No. Okay. That's your homework, Jeremy. Yeah, I got homework. Cause, Cause like, I don't, I, I lived in my feminine because I was in a dysfunctional relationship for five years mm -hmm. and, and for feminine, it's a lot of, I'll have to come up with that, like a specific mm -hmm. container. Because I know you work with men and women, so I thought yeah, you might it, have that as it's well. It's a lot of, for feminine, it's a lot of flow and flexibility. And there's probably one more F in there. Right? The challenge there's probably though, a lot. I, I can think of a couple off the top of my head. <laughs> well, I was say, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges for feminine is because of the, the going, going with the flow, you have to put a caveat. Whenever I hear someone say go with the flow, I'm like, hold on a second. What's the, the only kind of fish that goes with the flow? A, a dead one, because real fish swim against the current. Real fish swim for the things they want. So if, if someone's going with the flow, it's like they've given up versus grow through the flow. It's a little different twist. Mm -hmm. But it's that idea of just like going with it. It's like, and that's, that's the feminine nature sometimes is to just go with it because then you can, you can find your, your stability. The challenge is that it can go too far and it can become toxic and dysfunctional and, and trying to, well, I'll contort myself so much to make, to make me safe by not displeasing anyone. It's like, nah, sometimes you gotta, you gotta catch that check. Sometimes there are, there's the door you can leave. Well, yeah, I would say that that particular example of a feminine is a woman that's not in touch with her warrior archetype either, that she's in touch with her values to speak up and fight for what's important to her. There's a time to go with the flow and there's a time to fight the current to your point, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that's why I look, I look at people beyond, like, I, I don't think in my experience, women are not only feminine. It's like women can be of feminine course. and masculine. It can be a mask. It can be defensiveness. It can be a natural state. Like there's all, people are way complicated. And, and well, we got both in to, us. Yeah, people keep trying to put us in these tiny little thimbles and control us. And I'm like, nah, people are like squiggly and messy and mm -hmm. inconsistent mm -hmm. and, and amazing. And I love them. And so, you know, a lot of the work I do is to move away from fault, blame, guilt, shame. It's, yeah. it's, that, it's, that, it's, that, it's that ownership, response, ability, and appreciation. So it's like, how do I create room for somebody else to breathe wherever they are in their journey, mm -hmm. right? 
-hmm. Because for me, I went through some pretty bad stuff. I've unlocked what it meant to me, what it gave to me, et cetera, et cetera. I would never go to somebody else who is in the midst of their own process and say, well, this is a gift that you have to learn. To yes. Like, Thank oh, you. No, no, no. That drives me nuts. Yeah. Like, like that is so judgmental and dismissive and, and so not helpful because when you're in the, in the peak, thank you for saying that. When you're in the peak of emotion, that's the last thing you want to hear is someone be like, you know, look at the good side and, you know, see the gift in it. And one day you'll be grateful. And, you know, there's going to be a lesson here. It's like, I don't want to hear about the freaking lesson. This sucks right now. Yeah, yeah. That'll, that'll get my word to come out. And I'm going to cap you, dude, because no, that's yeah. not how it works. It's like you got to get on the other side of it to get to that evolved, mature place. But when right. you're in it, no, thank you. That's not helpful at all. It's like, you know, God forbid if someone passes away or a terrible tragedy in someone's life. And, you know, it's like there's really just nothing you can say other than just being present. You know, it's like there's no words. You know, for, yeah, 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 no, 100%. There's, there's, it's just again, it's the acceptance, it's sitting in that moment and just breathing, yeah. yeah, yeah, and just being there with them. And the the compassionate thing to do, the helpful thing to do is to, to your th first P, to be present is, is enough, you know, there, you know, there really is no fixing of that situation. I love that you have one, you have a podcast, Jeremy, which is great. And you, you have one of your topics on the three tips to please the queen. Great title. Thank you. <laughs> so can you, can you share with us a little snippet from what you've learned on uh, the three tips to please the queen? Three tips to please the queen. Or give us at least one, because I know I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, it's, it's been a while since we recorded that. I did that, with, I did that with my wife, right? The first thing really is, it, it is presence with her. It is, it is being there with her in the, the reality of not problem solving, not fixing, not, not quote unquote mansplaining, not, not trying to do what isn't being asked for. Yeah. Right. Like with my wife, it'll be when she's, when she's talking to me about something and it's something that has an emotional charge for her. I'm like, okay, babe, I love you. Just real quick. Am I in problem solving mode or listening mode? <laughs> like, like I already have a suspicion, but trust, but verify. So, so again, it's that honesty thing. Cause like, I don't, cause like she gets mad at me. She's like, I'm just venting. Would you shut up and let me talk? I didn't ask. Nope. Yes, ma'am. Right. And don't take that personal or just be like, Oh, how dare you? It's like, no, thanks for that. Again, honestly, thank you for letting me know your needs. I apologize. Yeah. That that's on me. Ownership, right? Yeah. And so that that being able to be present and then being able to appreciate, um, and I don't know if we put it in the podcast, but really being able to delight her. Like, what is something you could do that you know? It's like, oh, I want to shut my woman up, but in a way that takes her breath away. If you make that a game, I'm of like what. Good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's like you make her like catch her breath and like, oh, honey. And, and she feels that I have what I call the six golden tickets, but she feels seen and heard and understood, and appreciated, felt and, and then supported. Like if yeah. you can do those, those first five, then, the, yeah. then she'll receive. Yeah. Cause like a lot of times people get into conflict because they're offering support without being in rapport. And so it's see, hear, feel, think, and then appreciate is the gap. And then we've got the, uh, then we've got the support you can offer. So when they're attacking you or they're pushing back against you or stonewalling you or whatever, what they're telling you is you're out of rapport with them. And if you can hear that, again, be present. But if you can recognize that pushback and go, oh, that resistance is feedback to me that I'm ahead of myself. I need to go back to my breadcrumb trail and touch base on these other places and really connect with them. So when you can, when you can delight, like acknowledge and delight your woman, it is the freaking coolest thing because feminine drops hints all the time. Fabrics, colors, experiences, shapes, places, meals, the things that she's talking about that she's bringing up, you know, there's this Renaissance festival. Oh, there's this restaurant. Oh, this particular yeah, So fabric. pay attention, right? Listen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This, this right here, most guys don't use this well enough. Sorry. Yeah. I have my phone, but I have a log on here of like, what's your Chipotle order? What is her, like, what, where does she, where do we like to go to eat? What's her order? I have it written down. Wow. What are her sizes? What are her favorite smells? What are her favorite wow. colors? Wow. Like, you don't. This, I do. I love that. That's so nice. See, like, right, right. I'm like, you just got the, what was that reaction? The, oh, <laughs> he just got that from me. <laughs> That's, but think about it. Think about it. If, if every, if every partnership, 
right? Male, male, female, female, male, female, whatever the case. But if you made the lighting your partner like your biggest high, what happens? Because that's how you raise kids that can create their own emotional safety is because they're experiencing it, they're seeing it, they're feeling it, they're bathed in it, it becomes their normal. And then when they don't have that, they go, oh, this is weird. Great. But they don't blame themselves. They go, this is weird, not I'm wrong. Right, of course. It becomes, yeah, yep. We, yeah. we, we, we went to, for the holidays last year, we went to my sister-in-law's church and they did this thing outside. It was really cool, it was really awesome. And they were preaching about sin and my daughter was eight. And, and she turns to look at us and she's like, what's sin? And I was like, I was like, it's when you miss the mark. There you go. That's the official the, definition. The, the original. Yeah. So it's like, it, yeah. it's when you have room to grow. And then the pastor said something, something. And she was like, she was like, well, that's not me. I don't do those things. <laughs> right. And, and people might hear that and think, oh, you know, the right. pride of sin. And it's not the pride of sin. It's she doesn't hold petty jealousies. She doesn't try to mess people over. She's not in a place of scarcity to doesn't argue or lie, fight with people. Cheat, steal. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love it. That's so cute. I just I think the things that kids say are the, the greatest. There. I always say our 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 pets and our kids are our greatest teachers. The things that come out of their mouth and things my little dogs do, it's like, it's just it's just so great. Jeremy, that's what I tell parents. It, it be a guard and a guide for your kids. If you're a guardian and a guide, let them be your teacher. Because oh, you think you know what life is, mm -hmm. right? And then like you're busy going somewhere and you're stressed out of your gourd and your kid's like not reacting and you're like mad. You come over and yell at them and they're like, but there's ants, they're eating gum. And it's like the coolest thing in the world. And it's like, do you ever want to live your life so busy that you can't stop for a second and just go, you're right, dude, that is cool. That is cool. Like when we moved to Florida, like there's cranes, there's lizards. Like I'm still juiced about seeing lizards randomly running around doing stuff. And yep. we've got a, we've got an inside outside cat. She doesn't know how to kill lizards. So she brings them to us. She's like, here, I don't know what to do with it, but here. And so we've had like, I think eight or nine lizards brought into our house. Cause but they were alive, right? Cause they bring oh, them yeah, alive. They were alive. Yeah. And they're alive. Them yeah. Take them back out. yeah. Yep. Yep. Thanks, yep. Cat. Yeah. But that, that's your cat loving you. You're like, look what I got for you, Daddy. It's my contribution to the family. Yeah, because we're bad cats. Like, awesome. I, I read a thing that says dogs understand we are not dogs, and they like us anyway because they're we're fuzzy and cute. Because they they literally have the same oxytocin dump when they see us that we do when we see them. So to them, we're fuzzy and cute. But cats see us as like themselves. We're just big and and clumsy and incompetent, and that's why they bring us food. Is like, here, you pathetic thing, eat this. And like, yeah, yeah I can see that. We, we could get into a whole discussion about cats and dogs. Let me tell you. <laughs> I love, they're both awesome. I'm an animal person, my friend. You know, Jeremy, I just got to go back on all that great stuff you just shared about creating emotional safety and, you know, creating the delight in the, in the female, uh, in the, for, for the female in the relationship and your partner. And everything that I just experienced with your method, it, the, the delight you created in me and thinking that you've got on your phone this list of things that your wife likes so you can remember to do them to create delight in her is so endearing. And what I felt happen in my body was a softening take place. So I think the lesson here for us and to share with our audience is that for any men listening or whatever, and you know, the, the show Awakening Aphrodite is helping women and men get more in touch with their feminine nature, their receptive, trusting, allowing, soft, intuitive nature. And when you said what you said, I felt a softening in my body. And I know a lot of women that are driven and mission focused and wanting to, you know, help the world be a better place and all that. My big part of my audience, um, you know, we need help, you know, really getting that feminine more online and par with that masculine. So we go home to a partner, usually, you know, heterosexual most of the time, let's just say, and he might be like, you know, she's still in the masculine, that strong. Well, here you go, guys. Jeremy's technique of bringing in, this is a way to get the woman to soften because right there I was disarmed. Like I was like, oh. <laughs> you know, I just melted in my chair a couple inches down. So I just, just to share that that's very effective. I'm, I'm involved in a group called the National At-Home Dad Network. 
and that is like like seeing the polarity shift when the feminine is in a more masculine producing mode mm -hmm. and he's in the masculine the, the male is more in the nurturing mode there, there's a lot of the the, the polarity switches yeah. and well i can't get her to this and she doesn't do that it's really interesting to see some of the dynamics yeah. but for a lot of a lot of people the masculine like net worth is self-worth and I'm producing money that I have value and it's not for other people. It's for themselves. It's like, I need to make a certain amount of money or have a certain car or have a whatever. I got to be able to flex a certain way to define myself. And if guys understood, dude, your ability to create, you know, financial safety is important, but if you can create physical, mental, emotional safety that she can take off all of that stuff and just be at peace and be pampered. Like my wife, one of her favorite things, I do most of the cooking for dinner. She awesome. loves like, like we get a house. It's like, you know, you gotta have an Island. I gotta have a spot where I can perch and watch you cook. Cause she loves to sit and talk with me while I'm making food. Aww. Because that's just, that's just, that's cause she, she basically raised herself. Um, she was a latchkey kid in the 1990s at six years old, her and her sister. Cause third generation entrepreneur, there's a whole bunch of fun stuff in there. Um, but, but she did a lot of like, you know, six years old, she's expected to cook, clean, get yeah. dinner started before the adults come home. So it was like 1950s household mm -hmm. in the 1990s. And so it was, it was such a different experience. So for us as guys, like being able to create that emotional safety, she comes home from work and she's in production mode and now she's coming home and then she's like, I gotta switch gears and I gotta be nurturing, I gotta be all these things. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, hey. And I tell people all the time, I have a, a guide for it, but you need a transition ritual to get out of that producer mode. For men, it's to go from work mode into home mode, but he's yeah. still in a he's still in a very solid frame. But for feminine, go from producer provider, go from that warrior into the nurturer. She needs that transition ritual. And it's you she comes home, you acknowledge her, you smack her in the ass and send her to the showers. Mm -hmm. And you let her have time to decouple and get back into that open, flowing, graceful, not the, oh my God, you're home here, do this. And it's just produce, produce, yeah. produce, produce. And that's what happens. They walk in and they're like, Bleh! like, you know, yeah. Right yeah. And you, you, yeah. And that's part of what the trauma has been. Well, I shouldn't say trauma. Part of the challenge has been uh, with all this, you know, with the whole COVID pandemic BS with working at home and that whole transition, people don't have that transition time, that drive home from work right. period of, okay, this role to this role, even just to let their brain listen to the radio, listen to, you just, whatever it be. And then, then, then they get home, then they open the door or whatever, or the woman that works at home, or she's been home all day, whatever. Yeah, she's got the kids and she's got the psychological yeah. load. Transitions are key. And it's, if you can set your partner up for success and give them yeah. what they need to thrive, yeah. then it's easier for them to give you what you need to thrive. But if you demand what you need to thrive from someone who doesn't have it, good luck. Yeah. Well, if they don't have it to give. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's like, let me let, let you up. Let me give you what I want you to have because then you have it available to give back. And that Jeremy, that that's such a way of loving the person, because when they tell you, yeah, when they tell you what they need and you might even think it's stupid or like, I don't get it. What? Oh. But but yeah, let yeah. Right. But it doesn't matter. Right. It's your way of demonstrating. OK, I respect your need and I'm going to demonstrate my love for you by giving you that. That just is going to, the returns on that are going to be tenfold, right? Specific example. I had a client, she's 55 years old. And when I started working with her, she's in a lot of feeling anxious, can't explain it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. She's dating a guy. He's twice divorced. And for her, she needs a good morning text. It sets her day on a yeah. solid foundation, a morning text. Good morning, beautiful. Oh, okay. Just okay. she needs a text from him because they live an hour apart, but she just okay. needs a text in the morning to say blah, 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 right? This mm -hmm. is what she needs. She's communicated this. Well, he's twice divorced. I'm not going to have a woman tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. So I hear wound. Like, like she's describing to me immediately, I, I hear wound, unresolved with the feminine. He's got a feminine wound. No, no harm, no foul. He is where he is. Mm -hmm. But she's telling him what she needs. He's resistant to it. I already know the relationship is in trouble. Big time. Because yeah. here's what I need. I'm not going to give it to you because I'm not going to have you tell me what to do. Then you don't want to win with your partner. You want to win for yourself. So don't be in a relationship because you're not healthy yet. You're not available yet. Not to make you wrong is to recognize, again, be present to the reality. So, so that relationship ends up failing. Then I go through with her a process called Five to Thrive. And it's identifying five key areas. And I told her when you go dating, lead with this. Well, no, I have to make sure I like the guy. No, lead with the five because it's not about finding the one. It's about sorting out the no's. 
Because if you share your five to thrive and they give you grief about it, thank you for self-selecting out of my life. I'm not, I don't want to date you. Yeah. We can be friends and have a beautiful dinner and part as friends, but I'm not going to catch feels and then reveal my five to thrive and then have a broken heart. That's silly. Mm -hmm. So then she meets this guy. Uh, six months later, she meets this guy and he's, he's excited. He's doing everything and it's scaring her because he wants to win with her. And when she gives him feedback where she was made wrong in the past, he says, thank you. And then he grows. He doesn't change to placate her. He grows because he wants to win with her. Wow. He wants to win for her. And it, what's, it scares her because she's like, holy crap, what if this doesn't work? I'm like, then you learned, you learned what you need to adjust on your five to thrive, but look how much more you got versus the first relationship when we started coaching and what you weren't getting and now what you are. Look at the amount of growth because you showed up different. You're getting a different type of guy. Yeah, so yeah. it's... Yeah. It's okay to claim what you want. You know how far you're willing to go to give. I'll give at this level. Cool. You deserve to receive at that level. And if there's resistance, we got to clean that up because that's a self-worth thing that's going to sabotage stuff if we don't deal with it. Again, I'm not making you wrong. I'm, it's just the patterns and the way they're playing out, and we can readjust all this stuff. It doesn't take months or years. It can take hours. We can just pull it apart, rebuild it, put it back together, and move. So this brings up a couple of things for me, Jeremy. First of all, one of my favorite sayings, I don't know where I heard it. I'm sure you've heard it. I don't know who coined it. But when, sh when someone shows you who they are, believe them. My Angela. You know, thank you. I knew it was someone famous, but it's so true, right? So what, what I'm hearing you say is a, a gentle reminder for all of us. Pay attention. Just pay attention. When you, if you do express a need, a want, or a desire, is it respected? Is it, you know, and maybe someone's having a bad day, whatever. But honestly, if you've kind of said or expressed it a few times and the person is just blowing it off and not respecting it, you got to pay attention to that. People show you who they are. And it makes me also remember one of the most popular episodes on my show with Alison Armstrong. I can't quite remember. Love remember. She's a, she's a, she's the real deal, right? And that, yeah, we'll put it in the show notes for people. But she talks about how she tells people, similar to your five to thrive for people who are dating and finding someone compatible, she talks about how she coaches her people to, you know, on your first date or two, you're always putting on your best behavior and, you know, best manners and everything is your perfect. She says, does the opposite. She tells people to like dump all the stuff that's your crap. And if they're yep. still hanging around, then you got to keep her, you know, which I thought was interesting. She turns it on its head. It's really great. Yeah, no, you should start with being real first because then it's easier because they get the authentic you and there's no bait and switch. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's, yep. there's a line. It's a quote from, it's a quote from Chinese, but it's basically the clear, uh, the clear conscience doesn't fear the knock at night on the door. Yeah. Like if, if you're just, if you just act with integrity and be yourself. Mm-hmm. That's it. Because then it's not, you're not trying to trick them into it. This is who I am. And I want to find somebody who amplifies, right? The best relationship amplifies the joy and minimizes the pain. The worst relationships amplify the pain and minimize the joy. Like I do a whole training on power partnership versus power couple because power couple, you almost always end up with dueling masculine providers banging on each other all the time and not in a healthy way. Like they get friction burns from the battles. A power partnership, how do I align to help you be your best? Because the more I, the more I fill up my wife, the more she has available to fill up me and the kids. Mm. The more she fills me up, the more I show up to fill up her and the kids. If she gives me pain for non-compliance, I'm just going to keep distance from pain. That's what masculine does. Criticism doesn't motivate the best in masculine. It weaponizes us against you. Mm. You want our best. We want to be the hero, but you kick us in the nerds. We're just going to defend ourselves. And now you've made, us an, uh, uh, you've made yourself an opponent. Not a partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And again, I'm not, I'm not to judge that. I'm just, it's, it's a pattern that shows up. So it's hard and it's okay to acknowledge. I want to hurt you because I'm hurting, but I'm choosing not to, I'm doing this instead. Freaking tell your partner and they go, Oh crap. I didn't mean, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't want to be like this with you. I want something different. And then you can create and co-create something better. Mm hmm but just own that again, ownership. Like it's so much easier because then you can, once you own it, you can choose your response. You're not stuck in, I have to knee jerk, react, protect, fight. You can just own the response and be like, well, I want to respond this way. I, I feel this, but that's not who I want to be with you. I want to be this. Mm -hmm. 
can you help me? And the right person's going to be like, hell yeah, of course I can. I love the wrong this. person is going to push you and punish you. It's like, nerf that. It's, uh, it's, this is also important, Jeremy. And, uh, you know, I wish as we get toward the end here, uh, w what is always a constant theme with any re discussion about relationships is the absolutely essential component of having a foundation of safety. Because everything you're saying, we can't be honest. We can't talk about really what's really bothering us and what we really need, if we think we're going to be judged or, to your point, it might be weaponized against us or whatever, right? I mean, this happens a lot in relationships, right? It's like your emotional blackmail or, or you just care what the other person thinks, like a man might think she might think less of me or whatever. This all happens. It's all normal, right? So oh, 100%. What would be your advice to help us to get to a place where we can cultivate a relationship where we are safe or maybe even take it a step back and to know, am I safe with this? Per I mean, like, there is, do you think, Jeremy, there's a reason why people might not be going there emotionally to that real vulnerable place? Because in the back of their mind, they're thinking, I'm really not safe with this person. Or is that projection? I mean, what, how do we unravel this safety issue that's required for a really good relationship? Yeah. So, so two things. One is you have to make a promise to yourself. Do I want to be right or do I want to get results? Okay. okay. And if you are committed to being right, then continue doing exactly what you're doing. You'll keep getting what you, what you've always got. Right. I have guys that argue, but I wasn't wrong. And I'm like, but you're sleeping on the couch. Is that the marriage you want? Congratulations. You were right. And you're on the couch. Right. The, the one time my wife and I got into a real big argument very early in our relationship, she woke up at 2 a.m. because she went to sleep on the couch because she was mad at me and I was asleep on the floor because I had the five-year relationship where I spent two and a half years sleeping on the couch every night because, oh, I breathe too loud and trying to placate her and please her and da-da-da. I'm like, I'm not going to have a relationship where we withhold from each other. You can be mad at me. That's fine. I will come and I will stay. I'm not going to violate your boundaries and get on the couch with you, but I'm going to be within an arm's reach because, damn it, I looked for you for 30 years. I am not going to lose you over my ego or yours. Wow. And that right there, like, she, how does she argue with that and go, because she was going to come back to bed, but then she like almost stepped on me. And it's like, we had, we laughed about it and had a really good conversation at two in the morning, but it's like, no, I'm going to fight for you because, wow. oh my God, a woman, I've looked for you for literally 30 years. That's amazing. And, and so it's, but I want results. I don't want to be right. I'm willing to get out of my own way. I'm willing to take ownership and say, I screwed up. This is on me. But you're committed, you know, and you're, you're all, you're all in. I don't date, I relationship, right? Okay. Then the, the second piece is when I work with clients and we do the existential stuff, we unravel anger, sadness, fear, hurt, guilt, because we've got to get to the fundamental guilt. And every human being has the same existential hinge point until it is resolved, which is one of two flavors. Either I'm not enough or I'm too much. The corollary to either of those two beliefs is I won't be loved without love I'll die. Yes. And so if I'm not mm -hmm. enough, then I have to become more and I have to live this false thing. Yes. And that's where people get caught up in imposter syndrome. If I'm too much, then I'm constantly second guessing. I'm constantly holding back. I'm constantly placating and people pleasing because I can never say what I truly want. And the fact that somebody is in a place in a relationship to say, I don't feel safe to say what I need or want, that already tells you you're not in a good relationship. But if I don't have love, I'll die. And the hell I know is better than nothing at all. And my answer to that is no, nothing's better than pain. I lived 20 years in anger and defensiveness and all these things. No. Choosing and learning to be comfortable in and of yourself as your own person and healing your own stuff. Because once you've removed, I don't need to make my wife guilty. I have no drive for that. I have no desire for that. I have no intention to punish her. I have no need to punish my kids or shame my kids or embarrass my kids. Get their freaking attention. Yes. Play a role to let them know the impact of what they're doing. Yes. I can be loud with them. Yes. But at the end of the day, I'm glad you're alive. Thank you for being in my life. You're an amazing kid. I'm lucky to have you every damn night because it's the truth. And so if we are in a relationship where we can't speak what's inside our soul, we got to deal with our own stuff first. Am I in a clear place? Am I caught up in fault, blame, guilt, shame? And I got to go get that healed. Once I got that healed and I say something to my partner and they weaponize it back against me, that's their stuff. 
are they getting that addressed? And if not, now I have a decision because I can't save them from the from themselves. If they have a, a leaky hole in their bucket, I can't plug the hole for them. That's dysfunctional. You complete me as dysfunctional. You amplify me. You grow me. Those are different. But you complete me, then there's a gap in there that needs to be addressed and cleaned up. There's that that's dysfunction and that's not sustainable or healthy. And if you're raising kids in that environment, it's even worse because now that's where the generational stuff comes up because the kids normalize that dynamic and go, oh, that's, that's what's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And then they go out and create that until they get it resolved for themselves. Fantastic. There's so much great stuff in there. I can see why you're such a great coach. Uh, and uh, I love all these little colloquialism and phrases that you've come up with is really fun. <laughs> Jeremy, thank you. This has really been, I, I think, very valuable for a lot of people. Guys, I hope that uh, you share this with uh, with people that you think it's going to help. And uh, do check out Jeremy's uh, website and his work that's in the show notes. And Jeremy, before you share with us how they can find you, is there anything else you want to mention that would help you feel complete today or you feel a need to share? The, the one thing I want to leave you with, Everything we do as human beings, there's only two things. It's games and stories. Games is our behavior. It's designed to get energy. Either we're going to motivate it in positive ways or manipulate it in negative ways. Mm -hmm. However toxic a person is, there's a wound there that's unresolved. They're playing a negative game. There is a story that is driving that pattern of behavior. It is not your job to fix their story. It is theirs. Right? You cannot help them by jumping in the hole and drowning yourself with them. You score no karma points, you score no advantages. The world is not served by you diminishing yourself. A lighted candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. We don't fight darkness by fighting darkness. We banish darkness by being so full of light, it just disappears all by itself. We don't need to fight it. We just need to be aware and be present and be playful. Mm -hmm. You do that, your life will change. The lives of the people around you will change simply because you become a source of light. And the last thing is to mirror the light back to people because so many times we delete our own amazing magnificence because we're so wrapped up in, well, this one little thing's wrong. Like when I taught Kung Fu, there's 16 details to throwing a punch. And I want you to leave class today with one detail that you know you did right that you can carry forward. I don't want you to worry about the 15 you did wrong because we'll get that over time. That's not a problem. You just need to keep showing up. So the more we focus on the three or the 83 things we did right versus the three things we did wrong or three things we need to improve, your life will get better. Your kids' lives will get better. Your relationships will get better. Your business will get better because you focus on the things that went right. That's where you build your momentum. Mm -hmm. Pros and grows. This was good. This could improve. Pros and grows. Stay focused on that story. Everything transforms. Grows and grows. I love that. That's fantastic. Jeremy. You either win or you learn. I mean, when you're fighting, you win or you learn. Because <laughs> yeah. you didn't lose. Yeah. You, you got out there. You took your punches. Cool. What'd you learn? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just kind of processing that. It's really true. Yeah. Like So So as in if you don't win, you lose. It's like lo lose and learn. Like, yeah. Like the, well, the only way you lose is if you don't learn the lesson and you repeat the same thing again. It's like, then you didn't learn anything. Now you lost. That was silly. You wasted time. Like, like you, you only get hit because you're open. Stop being right. open. And, and, that, <laughs> and that, that just reminds me of me being an athlete. I would always want to play on the elite teams and with the boys and with people better than me. And I would get the crap beat out of me. And I was the wor literally the worst one on the team because they were so much better than me. But then, then when I went back to my own peer group, oh, my God. I was like literally circles. <laughs> and I was like the star. But, it, you know, but it was only because I was willing to put myself in the environment where I was the low person on the totem pole. Absolutely. And, you know, and so if you get in a, a situation where someone beats you, it's like, okay, what can I learn Sweet. about what they did? Yeah, it's so powerful. Still, still alive. Still yeah. alive. Cool. I got another yeah. quarter. Let's go. Yeah. But, but you have to have that confidence because then it makes me think of the kids nowadays, which unfortunately is pretty common from what I understand, you know, you know young teenagers and whatnot. They have this real it's almost like an epidemic of not wanting to make the physical effort because they're risking failing and then having to deal with the emotional blow of I failed and then not being able to handle that. So they don't put themselves in the arena. 
First attempt in learning. Awesome. What did you learn not to do again? Cool. Do it different. That's a story. Okay. It creates a game, right? We're, we're raising a generation at effect. They're at the result of versus being at cause. And it's an easy yeah. shift. Just mm -hmm. once you have the awareness, you go, oh, I'm living at effect. Yeah. Instead of being the boat, you're being the water pushed by the waves. Cool. What would it take for you to be the boat? How could you, and I'm not, you have to be a speedboat, powerboat, motorboat, cruise ship, but you act on the water. Cool. What do you want to do? Let's go explore that. Right? Success, think about success, it's wrapped in failure because failure is learning what not to do. I call it the success you're not looking for. When should you stop with the success you're not looking for or the success you are looking for? Because the fact you, you made an attempt, you put effort out, that already is a win because you're lapping everybody sitting on the couch waiting to be perfect before they start. Mm -hmm. You don't have to start to be great. I'm sorry, you don't have to be great to start. You have to start to become great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, there's, there's, okay, you're embarrassed. Cool. Suck it up. Rule 77. Suck it up, buttercup. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, to me, it's about, you know, either way you're going to be in pain. You can, you could pick your pain. You can either be, you can either be in pain because of the inertia of not doing anything and then feeling bad at yourself that you're not getting in the game, literally or figuratively of life. Or you can be in pain because, okay, maybe you're going to lose or get beat up or feel embarrassed or whatever. So you can be in pain either way, but one pain might lead to a greater glory. The other one Absolutely. is isn't. So I would rather take that 50-50 chance myself. Absolutely. Amazing. Jeremy Roadruck, incredible. How can people find you? Where would you like to direct our audience for more of you? I am the only Jeremy Roadruck on the internet, so I'm super easy to find. Wow, that's lucky. <laughs> well, there's only about 300 Roadrucks on the planet, so that's helpful. Wow. To me. It's a, it's a derivation of like, it's a German name and there's like, there's like eight or nine variations on it, but the road rock one is, is small. Um, so yeah, Google me, you'll find me everywhere. If you want to grab some time, it's, it's, it's in the show notes, leadlikeaking.com slash book hyphen now. Um, I'm mostly active on, on Facebook. I've got a presence on Twitter. Um, and I have a YouTube channel and I'm talking constantly about mindset, like, like peak performance relationships and mindset mastery. That is my jam. It's all games and stories. Mindset. And if you're, mindset, if you're suffering, baby. you don't have to, like you just don't, but, but we need to rewire some things. And so there's a couple different ways we can do that. If something here landed, please comment, encourage. Interesting stat I heard actually from, from Josh Tyler, Savage Gentleman, most men will not comment on social media except stuff they disagree with. If they agree with it, they nod their head and ignore it. Oh, that's right. And they move on. They don't, they don't be a mirror, reflect the light. Like we need that engagement to get that story spread out. So guys, if this landed for you, gentlemen, specifically, freaking comment, share, like be involved in the conversation. The world needs more good men to stand up. Right on. Amen. And that's what it's about is about, you know, helping us bridge this understanding for each other, because I think ultimately we all want to be in harmony. We all want to bring out the best in each other. We want to understand it because a lot of the, a lot of the problems are just misunderstandings, you know? So yeah. if we can be part of bridging that gap, I mean, we're going to be more powerful together. That's for sure. Yeah. So. I would love to see 8 billion people cooperating instead of competing. We could solve generational problems literally in one generation, and we would solve it for the rest of human consciousness forever. And to your point, it takes speaking out, like be engaged in the conversation, like, like say, yes, I agree, or share it, or whatever, like rather than being passive, you know, it's like participate. Absolutely. Participate. Absolutely. Yeah. Powerful stuff. Okay, everybody, if you enjoyed the show, you know what to do. Share it with someone else so you can do what we just talked about is getting this stuff out there and help the world be in more harmony and more power and love. And Jeremy, thank you so much for being on Awakening Aphrodite today. Amy, thank you. This has been a pleasure. Awesome. Okay, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Would you like to support my mission to help empower people all over the world to be all of who they truly are? If so, please subscribe to the show, leave a review on iTunes, and share it with a friend. And if you're looking to take immediate action to align your energy and optimize your health, visit amyfournier.com. Thanks for listening to Awakening Aphrodite. Let's awaken her together in you. 
I'm your hostess, Amy Fournier, and I already can't wait to be with you again and for you to hear what I have planned for the next show. Thanks for listening to Awakening Aphrodite with Amy Fournier. To learn more about Amy, check out her website, amyfournier.com. That's A-M-Y-F-O-U-R-N-I-E-R.com. You can also check out Amy's live and on-demand virtual fitness and yoga classes and sign up for her newsletter to receive a free mini ebook of three of her top tips for making holistic health a lifestyle. Again, that's amyfournier.com and get your ebook sent to your email immediately. Connect with Amy on the daily on Instagram at FitAmyTV, F-I-T-A-M-Y-T-V, and watch many of the podcast episodes and subtopic clips on her YouTube channel, which is also FitAmyTV. Enjoy, and we'll see you next time on Awakening Aphrodite.